I've been forgetting. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Nice to see all of you guys. Um, the, the few in the brain. Uh, so let's see. In terms of announcements, it's pretty simple. From here on out, your next homework is due next week. That means Chris and I frantically need to put together another homework uh, for this course. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. Because 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 Thanksgiving, um, yeah. Uh, thanks for the reminder. So again, it's due on Tuesday. Um, if you look at the dates, this is actually an extra week. It's just uh, it's hard to. No matter what you do, students get angry at you about Thanksgiving plus homework, like plus or minus a week. There's like no good way to schedule. Anyway, this is the best we can do. Um, cool. And if you like, give me a hard time, maybe I'll move my office hours a day early or something. Let me know if you need that. Uh, beyond that, yeah, you've got another homework coming up and a final, and that's about it. And we, oh, we put the date in time, like, you know, the, officially the registrar tells you the date of your final exam, but we also put it in the course spreadsheet. Um, I don't remember what it is, but it's there. <laughs> and, and like we promised, what was that? The 19th, good, so you can have a merry Christmas final exam. Uh, maybe we'll decorate the room for you. Uh, yeah, uh, and as promised, we'll, uh, uh, in the next homework, we'll, we'll give you some chance to do revisions on your midterm if that is of interest to you. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns? No? Yeah, favorite places to find fall foliage? It's over, we're done. Okay. North Carolina. North Carolina, that's so far south. Yeah, that's probably right. You know, pie recipes? No? Okay. Um, fine. And I guess we'll do numerical methods. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Uh, right, so, so in today's lecture, which I'm guessing might spill a little bit into the next one, it should if I take my time, which is obviously a struggle for me, but I'm working on it. Um, essentially, you know, hopefully, <laughs> even if you've missed some of the details the last couple of weeks, you've gotten the high level point which is that we've been studying problems, uh, algorithms for optimization. And unlike some of the other optimization courses in this department, we've really been focusing on the sort of generic case, right? Like I'm given access to some function f and its derivatives, and now I just want to like happily move down the gradient of f and maybe try to satisfy some constraints while I'm at it, right? Um, and so initially we, we proposed a bunch of different algorithms like gradient descent and Newton's method, which really don't make any assumptions on f beyond having a pretty good initial guess and having a gradient. But then, in our last two lectures, we kind of did the opposite of that. We said, like, we're going to put, like, the strongest possible assumption on f, in some sense, which is that we are going to decide that the only f that I care about is f of x equals 1 half x transpose a x minus x transpose b. For some reason, I kept putting a c there, but obviously that doesn't matter for optimization. Um, and what do we observe for, for uh, conjugate gradient method was that, like, in this case, I know a heck of a lot more <laughs> about f. I mean, I know that it's quadratic, I know it's gradient, and that allowed us to do a lot of stuff that we couldn't do for our generic optimization routine. Like, for instance, line search wasn't really necessary anymore because along any line, this is just a parabola, and we know how to minimize a parabola, right? This is like roughly, what, 10th grade algebra? You're, you're MIT students, like 6th grade algebra. Um, and uh, similarly then, uh, in fact, we knew so much about this that if we assume that A is symmetric and positive definite, in particular, it has a Cholesky factorization, and that's sort of what kicked off our whole derivation of the conjugate gradient algorithm. Right? So even if you missed <laughs> everything that happened after that, right, the high level point was that because a, uh, we can write A equals LL transpose, we can kind of interpret this whole thing as some kind of a norm, and that allowed us to make a particular change of coordinates and do all that magic stuff that we do, all right? So, if we step back like 100 feet from that lecture, what should be the takeaway? If we know a lot about f of x, then we can probably do better than gradient descent. All right, that, that's sort of the point. And generically, this is true. I think that like oftentimes these days, we are, uh, depending on what scientific community you fall into, you have some generic optimization strategy or another. Uh, for many people in our department, it would be stochastic gradient descent. Uh, for people in other areas, it would be BFGS. Um, like in engineering disciplines, that, that's I think the most popular option. And these are all tools that work perfectly well, right? For, for anything that's differentiable, they're, they're, they're great. Um, but they may be slow. <laughs> and, you know, essentially, the more structure that you have hiding in your objective function, the better you can do, right? And so today, 
You know, some of the lectures in this class, we dive into a lot of detail. Like we did conjugate gradient and like excruciating detail. Today is going to be kind of the opposite. I'm going to give you just like a bit of a flavor for the kind of things that people do in this domain. You can easily build an entire course around like home brewing optimization techniques for different objective functions. Um, but we only get an hour and a half. So I thought like essentially my, my goal for you today is like when you look at an, an, an objective function, like so for instance, maybe, I don't know, what's a good one that shows up a lot? Uh, maybe my objective looks like, you know, least squares. And then I add, you know, like the L1 norm of X. This is a very typical example. Well, now none of our algorithms apply anymore. Not even gradient descent in some sense, because this isn't differentiable. Your homework tells you how to address that. Um, you can still ask, like, can I cook up some optimization technique that says, like, well, if I only care about objectives of this form, Maybe there's some clever thing I can do, right? And, and this is like the first question you guys should all ask. Like anytime you look at your problem, you know, as engineers, maybe you're happy to have reduced your problem to optimization. That's like step one. But then as numerical analysts, you should look at your objective function and say like, what special structures are hiding in here that I can take advantage of? Okay. Okay. So that's, that's basically our, our, our situation. So our story so far is that like, Newton's method works for like totally generic, gigantic classes of objective functions. Conjugate gradient is the example of the opposite of that, like a super narrow class of objective functions for which we can do a lot better. Maybe there are other nice object oops, uh, ah, uh, objective functions that also admit fast or element. I think I meant efficient optimization uh, methods. Fast and efficient. I'm going to be honest, I don't remember why. I. Yeah, I mean, like that's like in, in essence some of the algorithms will derive, but I don't, I don't. I think it's just a weird typo. See, the problem is that like I'll have you know suits playing in the background while I'm typing these slides, and then like occasionally, you know, like the Duchess and Jesse Pinkman or whoever the characters are will kind of sneak into the the content of the lecture. Um, in any event, we want fast optimization algorithms that are specific to particular objective functions. Okay, um, and in particular, I think a very common thing to do is to come up with some class of, of, of objectives and then try to design some bespoke thing. So like for instance, here's some, some very typical examples. One is maybe like the sum of an easy to optimize thing and a non-differentiable but kind of element thing, right? Like so for instance, like here, AX minus B squared, if that second term weren't there, I'd know how to deal with this. I could find the global minimum pretty easily. Um, so maybe I want to kind of leverage that fact, but then I've got this, this pesky, pesky second term I don't know how to deal with. Or maybe it's, um, so like the second one's a, a, a different one of these things. Maybe it's like the sum of two functions that I would know how to optimize if the other guy weren't there, right? That's another very typical case. Um, there are many of these things, right? And, and there are people that build whole careers on algorithms for different special cases of, 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 of objectives. So everybody can understand our high level motivation here. Cool. So we're gonna go through a bunch of these things and Again, our goal here is that when you are sitting making your millions of dollars consulting and doing whatever it is that you're going to do with your fancy MIT degrees, um, the first thing you're going to do is, is send research grants to your old numerical analysis instructor. And then after that, you're going to look at whatever people are, are, are working on. You're going to think, like, well, what bucket does this thing fall in? What structures could I take advantage of? We're going to see many examples just to kind of help you categorize. Okay. So here's one common one. Let's say that I want to solve regression problems. Like least squares, like if there's a takeaway you should have from this course is that like least squares apparently is pretty important. <laughs> um, but sometimes our least squares problems are not linear. So for example, let's say that I want to fit a function of the form uh, of, of some exponential form, right? So I want to, uh, you know, what I really like is to fit a function f of x. I guess in this notation I'm calling that y, uh, which is I guess equal to C e to the ax, given a bunch of like x i y i pairs. Right? This is like a totally reasonable problem. Right? So what would I do? Well, I think if we were all presented this thing, um, first of all, you probably would, your inclination would probably be to replace this thing with like a neural network, which is equally nonlinear and annoying. But that aside, um, notice that our least squares algorithms don't apply here because our objective function. So what are the unknowns here? They, I guess, are A and C, right? Those are the parameters of our exponential model. I probably would do something with the following. I'd sum over my data set. Um, I have yi minus A e to the axi. 
squared like that, right? Obviously, if this thing is zero, I've got a perfect fit for my data, right? What is that? Oh, yeah. I even like stood back, I looked at it, I processed it, and I wrote the wrong thing. There we go. Thanks, Bob. Okay. But notice that because of this, this pesky E here, um, this is not a linear problem. In fact, I think it doesn't even really fall into the kernel regression that we, we talked about on your homework. Which is kind of why I chose it. Uh, okay. So what are we to do? Well, this thing is an objective function in AC pairs, right? So I could very easily do gradient descent on this problem. And in fact, if I wanted to do converge even faster, what would I probably do? Like Newton's method, right? And, and this is a reasonable uh, uh, blah, application of Newton's method, for sure. But it turns out that objectives specifically of this form uh, emit yet another nice algorithm. And this is going to be our first example of like, oh my gosh, my objective has a particular form, and now I can use a particular algorithm. And in particular, it comes as no surprise that like, people want to solve problems that look like this all the freaking time, which is just uh, what we would call nonlinear least squares problems. Right? It's nonlinear because fi here is not linear. <laughs> okay? Um, so, so for example, here the fi, I guess, would be uh, precisely this, this term here uh, summed over the i's. Does that make sense? So this thing is fi, I guess, of a comma c in that notation. Okay. And there are so many different problems that fall into this space because essentially almost any regression problem you can formulate like this. Right? So for instance, um, you know, I feel out of date because I use an exponential model. Let's say that I have a neural network and it's parameterized by a bunch of weights. We'll call the weights theta. I'm going to pretend to be a statistician today, so my unknowns are theta. Okay? So uh, in this case, um, well, I could look at the neural net's prediction on a given data point, xi, and I could subtract off the true value, squared, sum, and my problem, of course, falls into the same class, now as a function of theta instead of a function of a and c. Right? So problems like this are, are totally generic. So we have two algorithms so far that, that, that apply to this, right? Newton's method and gradient descent. And we like Newton's method because it takes fewer iterations. We don't like Newton's method because it requires a Hessian, and Hessians are annoying. Right? So what are we to do? Well, uh, here's a, a thing that I've mentioned a few times in, in lecture already. Why does Newton's method need a Hessian? Right? Like, remember how we derived it? Like, we made a two-term, or I guess three-term Taylor series, and then we minimized that, and that's like sort of one iteration of Newton. What was our, our motivation? Like, why three terms in our Taylor series and not like two? I think I've asked this precise question in lecture before, so I know you guys know the answer and you're just being quiet. Yes? We're doing root finding on the gradient. That's absolutely right. But in particular, if I, if I approximate my Taylor series with a linear function, or I approximate f with a linear function, let me abort that sentence and try again. Let's say I approximate my objective function with something linear. What is this minimum? with high likelihood. Minus infinity, right? So does it make sense to have two terms in my Taylor series? No, right? So that is sort of like the explanation for Newton's method. It like chooses the, the smallest number of derivatives you need in f in order to have an interesting minimizer in each step. It's a perfectly reasonable way to motivate it, yeah? So that's annoying because we don't want to compute Hessians. So for example, um, consider this objective function here. What would it take? For me, to, you know, maybe I call this uh, energy of theta. So in order to use Newton's method on, on this thing, what would I need? I'd need the second derivative of my energy with respect to d theta i, d theta j. And even though we haven't talked about um, backpropagation, I think we would all agree that, that, that this is a bad idea. Right? Like generally, um, neural networks have how many weights these days? Billions, right? So how big is this matrix? Billion, like really big, <laughs> like billions squared, right? So I couldn't even store this thing, let alone compute it, and never mind like the steps of backpropagation would be way slow for, for second derivative. Now, of course, there, there are ways around that. There's all kinds of clever things people do for Hessian vector products, but like just generically speaking, like this is not a matrix I want to touch if, if theta is really big. That makes sense? So what are we to do? Well, we need curvature in order for Newton's method to work. We need that H. But we don't have access to that H because it's like ginormous and it's annoying to compute. 
that's, that's our, our situation so far. Okay. By the way, this is a simple way to remember that is that like a straight line doesn't really have a minimum. Or if it does, it's a boring minimum. Okay. So there's one exception to this rule. There's one way we can linearize things and actually have curvature. This is magic. This is a really clever trick. This is one of the more classical optimization tricks, by the way. It goes back to um, Gauss and Newton, I believe. That's like a high power name, pair of names to be attached to an algorithm. Um, in particular, Gauss and Newton made the following observation. Let's say that my objective function, specifically, remember we're solving like nonlinearly squares um, of x, what, it had the following form, sum over i of fi of x squared. By the way, it's very typical for the fi's to like share structure, um, but that like kind of doesn't matter for, for our purposes so far. Okay, so, so notice I have made an assumption, right? Not all objective functions look like this one, but, but an awful lot of them do. Okay? Oops, I put these parentheses here because I was going to use clear notation and I put the square in the wrong place, but it doesn't matter. Uh, okay. The idea is, how can we linearize something and end up with curvature in our problem? This was a clever idea from Gauss and Newton. Incidentally, we often put a one-half here for mathematical convenience, but that obviously doesn't matter. I'm saying linearize something. There's really only so many options. We've got F, the E and the Fs. Let's say that I, I, I linearize F, okay? So in particular, um, let's say that I take Fi of x and I approximate it as Fi of x naught plus, um, yeah, man, uh, we'll say the gradient of Fi x naught dot product x minus x naught. Hopefully we all agree that this is the linearization of, of fi. So I'm only going to have these two terms. I'm not going to I'm not going to have the third one, which is what I would need for Newton's definite, right? However, what happens if I plug this thing in to the square? Well, now so this thing is approximately one half of the sum over i of fi, which is fi x naught plus gradient fi x naught, oops, dot product x minus x naught squared. Okay, so take a look. Now, like this looks linear, but there's a square outside of the x. So this is actually a quadratic objective function. This is a li linear least squares problem. Do you see that? So this is the one magic special case where I can manage to engineer a curvature in my objective function using only first derivatives. Do you see that? Because the thing that I'm using the, uh, for first derivatives is not e, it's fi. Now notice, if I look at the quadratic term of this problem, it is not the Hessian of the original problem, but it's, it's, it's a pretty good approximation oftentimes. In fact, you can convince yourself that it's basically the Hessian, but any time that you see the Hessian and you're, you're, you're like, what's the right way to put it? If I did the chain rule on this thing twice, right, then I'm going to get some expression involving the Hessians of the Fi's and the gradients and everything else. If I just zero out every term and term involving the Hessian, I'll get this approximation. I'll let you do that one at home. Um, okay. Uh, moreover, we can, we can make kind of a slick uh, notation for this thing. So, so let's say that big F of x is equal to like F1 of x, F2 of x, and so on. So we're just going to stack it together into a giant matrix. And we're going to call df is like the Jacobian of this thing. So it's like every possible gradient stuck together in a big matrix. right? And then essentially what we've done, oops, oh no, uh, is, is uh, this objective function is exactly one half big F of x naught, right? So now every single kind of element of this thing is one term here, uh, plus df times x minus x naught. You see, this is just slick notation for the, the previous sum. Cool? And again, what is our, our unknown and one iteration of, 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 of uh, the Scouts-Newton method? It would be x, right? Everything else here is constant. Okay? So let's make sure that we did our math right. 
Ta-da. Um, okay. So in particular, uh, what is the minimizer of this thing? How should we do it? Well, we should take the gradient and set it equal to zero. You guys tired of this yet? So um, in particular, lucky for us, this is exactly the, um, what do you call this thing? The normal equations, right? So you're going to end up with, what, df transpose df, as usual. So in particular, I'm too lazy to write it, but lucky for us, it's on the screen. Here is the Gauss-Newton algorithm. Take a look. Let's compare it for just a second to uh, 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 Newton's method. You guys have any observations? Like, what, what is the relationship between these two things? Uh, because I made a typo. Yep, good, good catch, man. Shoot, this is the one new set of deck of slides that I made from scratch in this class so far. All right, so I hope somebody's keeping track of all these typos. I'll fix later. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, I'm sorry, it should be xk plus 1 on the left-hand side here. My apologies. Um, shucks. But, but in any event, um, the relationship between this and uh, Newton's method is pretty straightforward. It's uh, basically you just took the Hessian and Newton's method and replace it with df transpose df. That's, that's, uh, that's the only difference. But the good news for us is that uh, this matrix uh, doesn't ever need Hessian of anything. Yes, Harry. What was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a reasonable question. Why is it okay thing to do? Well, why is Newton's method an okay thing to do? They're, they're both approximations, right? Um, but but if, you, if you want to be a little more formal about it, I, I, I think one, one reasonable way to think about it is the following. Let's say that um, each of the fi's is nearly linear, like it's a pretty flat function, right? Then the Hessian term is going to be relatively small. And that's essentially what's going on here. Yeah. So this uh, actually a good way to remember this is like this, this approximation works well when each of the fi's is like nearly equal to its linearization, which isn't surprising because like if each of the fi's were linear, this would be perfectly right, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I believe the convergence proof for this method is a little bit annoying because it's sort of non-local, right? Like you you don't you don't have the nice Taylor series properties that you have otherwise. Cool. So this is this is Gauss Newton algorithm. Here's a nice uh, additional kind of bonus. Um, notice that for Newton's algorithm, uh, remember we ran into trouble when the Hessian isn't positive definite, right? Like the Hessian might have a negative eigenvalue, and then suddenly you're maximizing instead of minimizing by accident. Notice that that like actually can't happen here, right? Because the matrix you're inverting is always positive, at least positive semi-definite, right? This df transpose df, which is an added kind of practical benefit of this this technique. Cool. Now, Harry asked a reasonable question, which is like, is this thing any good? And the answer is like, it's not a great approximation of f. Like, we, we've been pretty cavalier about removing terms from our Taylor series. Um, in some sense, like, it's perfectly fine so long as x is close to x, the, the previous x, right? Like, like, just because these Taylor series are absolutely true, right? These still vanish as, as, uh, as ah, sorry, I'm saying words, too many words. As x0 and x are close to each other, this two-term Taylor series is, is, is perfectly fine, right? So this method is perfectly okay in a very small neighborhood of x0, right? It's okay, like there's a square here, absolutely, but like it's okay to take the Taylor series and then square, like your, 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 your small terms are still small, yeah. However, as x goes away from x0, this Taylor series becomes bad. It's not even a Taylor series for the outer thing, as, as Harry points out, right? So one thing that we might do is say that, well, we kind of like this method, but we also don't want to move too far away from, from xk when we make xk plus 1. Again, the left-hand side of that expression should be xk plus 1. Somebody remind me of that after class. Um, so what are we to do? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All of these methods, including Newton's methods, work really poorly if you have a bad initial guess. Well, it turns out that, like, actually, I think this is a pretty stable method because, like, it really it knows at the very least not to mi to maximize your function ever, um, which is kind of nice. <laughs> and I think for a lot of problems that look like least squares and are kind of flat, like this, actually is pretty effective. Yeah. Um, what are the like, what are 
Uh, that's a good question. So, so uh, let's see here. So the x's are whatever they are. Um, the df is a big stacked together pile of every gradient of every one of these fi's. What was that? It's uh, no, uh, not quite. So, so if f, if x is n dimensional and there are, I don't know, k terms in the sum, then df is n by k or k by n, whichever one makes sense. Oh, uh, sure. So um, specifically for this one, I guess uh, df would be like two by k or k by two. I, I'm bad at order, but whatever. That's right. So, so like the, uh, in this case, this would probably not be a great idea. Like you might as well just compute the hash rate. Yeah, because it's tiny. <laughs> um, cool. So uh, right. So as we've all pointed out in different ways, like essentially this is a very bad approximation of e. If I get too far away from x, it's a very difficult thing to do is to say I don't want to go too far away from x. Yeah, um, and that leads to a slight. Uh, change to this algorithm known as Levenberg Markart. You might notice these are, by the way, just like a bunch of flags you can turn on and off in your favorite Python software. So now you have some idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so it's kind of funny to me that Levenberg, Gauss Newton, and Levenberg Markart get two completely different sets of names for like a very superficial change, but I digress. Um, here's what we're going to do we're going to do exactly the same thing we did before. We're going to introduce this approximation. But now we're going to add a constraint, which just says that like I'm going to prescribe some delta, and not allow x to go farther than delta away. Then we call this algorithm levenberg markart So um, this algorithm feels expensive. Now we have to solve an inequality constraint optimization problem. Um, however, there's a bit of a sleight of hand that happens in levenberg markart which is which is a sleight of hand. It's it's actually like what people call levenberg markart is a bit of a hack. Because what's going to end up happening is that delta is going to change in every iteration to make our math e easy. Uh, and let me, let me show you precisely what happens. This is kind of a sneaky trick. It turns out it's actually OK. It's like sort of an average between Gauss-Newton and gradient descent. Um, and, it looks, and it looks a little something like this. So um, where did I put my chart? Here it is. So <sighs> let's. Let's take our, our, our optimization problem on the board and write it out in a little more detail. Uh, and in particular, uh, we're going to make a few definitions to make our life easier. Um, I'm going to call a matrix H, which isn't really the Hessian of the original problem, but is the Hessian of E naught, right? So this is going to be equal to df x naught transpose df x naught. Right? So this is basically the, the matrix we want to invert. Um, and moreover, uh, we'll call delta x, x minus x naught. And the reason to do that is that the problem on the screen looks something like this. So now you've got delta x, which is like the little vector pointing toward the next iterate of your, your algorithm. Um, and you've got the quadratic term. So this is delta x transpose h delta x um, plus f of x naught transpose d f. Uh, delta x. And if you look back on the previous slide, you'll see that these are, this agrees exactly with, with the problem we just saw. Um, but we have this annoying restriction, which is that this is less than or equal to delta. Okay. And again, why are we doing that? Like, this is some quadratic approximation of our objective. As Harry points out, it's a bad one. It only agrees to like first order, not to second order. But it's got some curvature, and it agrees to first order. <laughs> Um, and uh, but so what we're going to do is like we're going to optimize, but we're we're just going to prevent ourselves from going too far. Right? That's what's going on here. How should I solve this problem? This is like the answer to almost every question I ask in this class. Like I write down a problem on the board, I need a formula for its solution. How am I going to do it? Lagrange multipliers, wrong. No, uh, sorry, <laughs> K and T conditions. But basically, Lagrange multipliers. Okay. So, luckily for us, a few lectures ago, we derived the K and T conditions, and since you guys are all busily studying for your final exams, you have them memorized. So, um, in particular, uh, what is our stationary condition? Our stationarity. Remember what this looks like? It's basically you set the gradient equal to not zero anymore, but like a multiple of the uh, constraint, right? So in particular, 
is going to be 0 is equal to h delta x plus um, d f x naught transpose f of x naught. Right, so that's just the gradient of the objective in delta x. But now we need to add plus um, lambda delta x, where lambda is going to be the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this constraint. OK? You guys see that? So this is, again, I set the gradient equal to 0, but now I have to add Lagrange multiplier times the gradient of the constraint. Same, same as, as Lagrange multiplier. But we have a bunch of other things. So we have um, primal feasibility, which is basically just this, right? Mod of dx is less than or equal to delta. We've got complementary slackness. <laughs> and remember what this says? It says that the product of the dual variable and the constraint is equal to 0, right? That only the one of the primal or the dual variables can be non-zero. So in this case, uh, lambda times delta minus the norm of the difference is equal to zero. And then finally, we've got dual feasibility, which is just delta greater than or equal to zero. Incidentally, if you look in the book, I, I do this really carefully and like align it to the notation of KKT conditions. Here I have elided a factor of one half because we're all grown ups. Yes? Uh, it's close to the midterm question. Yeah. Is it the midterm question that I really liked? No. Because I said so. There's a difference, but I forgot. Maybe not. No, yeah, maybe this is the same. No, yeah, this is the same. Actually, it is, but we're, gonna, we're about to do something different with it, so it's okay. And honestly, even if I give away the midterm question, it's fine, because the midterm already happened. Maybe if you guys had read a few chapters ahead, you would have got it right. Uh, <laughs> okay, but I digress. Okay, so um, in particular, <laughs> we are going to do something slightly different with this thing, because we're deriving this algorithm and not the, the algorithm in the midterm question. So, the other, and, and in fact, in levenberg barkhart maybe the reason that they don't, like the algorithm we derive in the midterm question happened like 100 years after this thing. Maybe that's why. Like the, the, the derivation we're about to do is a lot easier. Um, OK. That got me all confused. Uh, so in particular, let's solve this thing for uh, delta x. Yeah, and, and in particular, notice there's a linear system of equations, right? So we've got h times delta x plus lambda times delta x is equal to, and then we've got, um, I guess I'm confused because there's a minus where I didn't expect there to be a minus. Eh. All right, we'll put a minus. Um, minus df x naught transpose f of x naught. This is a new chapter in the book, which is why I'm like questioning signs of things more than other parts of, of this class. Um, <laughs> This is the minus that I'm suspicious of, in case you're, you're curious. <laughs> so we'll go back and double check later. OK. Um, right. So here's the good news. Notice that this matrix is positive definite as long as lambda is positive, right? So um, here's what we're going to do. Um, suppose for a second that this is active, OK? Then in particular, these two guys are equal. And then generically, what will happen, so if the constraint is active, this term is 0. This is where like, heuristic things are happening, if you're wondering. Like, so far, what we did is math. Now we're doing heuristic. But that's OK, because like, this is Gauss Newton. OK? Um, so if this thing is 0, then that allows lambda to be greater than 0. And in particular, what that means is that this thing is a positive definite matrix, which is good, because it's invertible. OK? So in any event, here's what levenberg markhart does. They go through this whole derivation, and then they basically throw it away a little bit. <laughs> and they just say, like, oh, this seems like an interesting formula. <laughs> Notice that when lambda is equal to 0, that's just the old Gauss-Newton algorithm. 
which makes sense because that corresponds to our constraint being inactive. And it's when lambda is positive, which uh, notice by dual feasibility, lambda is never negative. So our, our, our matrix is never indefinite, right? When lambda is positive, in effect, notice that it's basically making the norm of this thing smaller in some sense. So uh, what levenberg markhart does is he says, well, I can solve a sequence of steps. Again, the left-hand side of this should be k plus 1. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but essentially, we're going to do the same update, but now we're just going to add lambda times the identity to our matrix. Okay? And notice that like there exists a lambda that achieves the constraint here, right? Like, that's what these, these optimality conditions say. Now, one thing that we didn't do here is derive the correct lambda. <laughs> so like if you prescribe delta, right, then there's a particular lambda in this formula that will achieve the solution to this problem. But Levenberg Markhart says, eh, I don't care. I'm just going to take lambda to be a constant, and I'm going to forget where this problem came from. <laughs> so this is a long-winded way of saying the Levenberg Markhart algorithm is actually quite straightforward. All it does is it takes Gauss-Newton and it adds a constant multiple of the identity at each iterate to the matrix you invert. And the motivation behind it is that this corresponds to reducing the norm, like the difference between x and x naught. So you're right. It started out looking like the exam problem, but the exam problem actually figures out what is the proper lambda to achieve that constraint. levenberg markhart doesn't bother. It just takes lambda to be a constant, and it says, in effect, delta is changing in every iteration. <laughs> It's a little weird. This is like a totally backward justification for this technique. But I think it does actually give you a little bit of an intuition, which is to say that like, essentially for every positive lambda, if I kind of reverse engineer this, there exists a delta for which <laughs> this is the optimal solution. right? And so in effect, what's going on is that it's just bringing each of the iterates closer to the previous one. Right? That, that's all. And the reason is that um, the farther you go away, the worse your Taylor series gets. Incidentally, this is emblematic of a larger trick, which is that oftentimes in optimization, you see people take the Hessian and just add a multiple of the identity to it. And this is kind of why. Like, essentially, all it's doing is like pulling back your step a little bit. Yes? You can also do that. Yeah. So this would be kind of like the Lancer's trick, like, like just take our update and shrink it. Yeah. That is another thing people do. Uh, that's a good question. I, so one reason that I think people think of this as better, or at least like an interesting option, is that like sometimes h might be singular. So for example, let's say that like uh, my nonlinear least squares problem, like sometimes a bunch of the terms are zero, right? In that case, um, this matrix might not be invertible, but the second that I add lambda times the identity, it has to be invertible. So I think that's one reason people do this. And also, like, even if I have an eigenvalue that's close to zero, this thing is going to push it away, so you won't like have one over a small number. Yeah. Otherwise, in your method, like, you could still have the case where it blows up. Yeah. I saw another hand, and then it went away. Cool. So anyway, these are just two different methods for um, nonlinear least squares, which is just one example of the kind of problem that you can solve using bespoke optimization techniques. Yes. So I have a question. Uh huh. Why is this better than gradient descent? Ah, because there actually is second order information here. This is, you are using first order information on the FIs, but that translates to some curvature on the nonlinear least squares problem. That's the basic point. That like, this is a reasonable approximation of the Hessian. I mean, think about it this way. Like, if all of the FIs were actually straight lines, this would be exactly the solution to the, the least squares problem, right? And so like, it's not that you somehow like, Whereas gradient descent would still take a long time to converge. So this really, yeah. It's like somewhere between Newton's method and gradient descent. Yeah. Cool. So continuing in this, if we wanted to make our problem even more complicated, we could, take, we could consider the weighted least squares uh, problem, which is the following. So now, each of my least squares terms, like I've, I've changed the s into g's, I guess, um, have an additional f in front of them. Um, and now there's all kinds of interesting ways that we can solve this problem as well. Um, one interesting uh, thing that people do a lot in these uh, problems is to solve the following, which is called uh, iteratively reweighted least squares, which does the following. It says, okay, in my optimization technique, I would like to use Gauss-Newton, 
I, I now have a new hammer, and I'd like to hit it with my nail. But the, now I've got this pesky F sitting in front of it, so I can't use Gauss Newton anymore. So what I'm going to do is pretend like that F is constant and optimize G. This feels totally wild, but let's actually do an example of, of uh, we can derive two different uh, famous algorithms using uh, essentially this special form. I think once you do an example, you see that it's actually kind of sensible. <laughs> okay? Uh, and that's L1 optimization, and then a special thing for the geometric median problem. Has anybody ever heard of that one? It's like the world's most complicated way to compute the median of a set of numbers in 1D, but in higher dimensions, it's interesting. Okay, so. Here's, a, here's an interesting thing I can do. Um, let's say that I, I want to solve the following problem. I want to solve min of ax minus b, our favorite problem, but now I'm going to change it ever so slightly and put the L1 norm there. <laughs> okay, so in particular, what is this thing? So if we expand out our function a little bit, this is equal to the sum over the rows of my matrix, ai dot product with x minus bi absolute value. Now one thing you guys might know or you might not know is that um, the, the sort of mythology here is that absolute values sort of promote sparsity. They, they, they tend to want values to be exactly zero whereas least squares wants you to be close to zero. It's sort of the high level qualitative picture that often happens. One way to remember that, <laughs> I, I really like this analogy where like if I have a square dinner table and I'm a toddler running around it, <laughs> right? What happens? Well, like, where am I going to bump my knee? It's always going to be in the corner of the dinner table, right? And that's sort of exactly like the corners of the unit circle or square in the L1 norm. So in particular, oftentimes this is like a robust version of least squares. It says like, some of these terms are good, so I want them to be exactly zero, like ax equals b. And then other terms I'm just going to ignore, as opposed to the usual least squares problem, which says I want to do kind of well on all the terms in my sum, right? A different way of, of understanding that if I just plot these squares versus, you know, absolute value, if my error gets twice as big in least squares, I'm penalized four times as much, right? So really big errors in least squares are a big deal, right? In these absolute value problems, really big errors are penalized just as much as really small errors. So like, I kind of like, it doesn't cost me quite as much to just like put it all in one term of my sum, right? Um, okay, so in any event, let's say I want to solve this problem. Sadly for us, once again, none of the algorithms we've written down so far apply to this function, which is frustrating, right? We're actually going to develop a few different algorithms for this problem because this is a pretty common one in statistics. Okay? So here's a fun way that we can write it as, as an iteratively reweighted least squares problem. So I'm going to do something that feels like a total hack, and that's because it is. But it turns out this is actually one of the predominant ways to solve this problem. <laughs> this is equal to, let's suppose that none of the terms in the sum is equal to zero. Obviously, this somehow feels very uncomfortable because the whole point of this thing is to get some of these terms to zero. But let's not think about that too hard for a minute. Then one thing I can do is say, well, this is one over the absolute value of ai dot x minus bi times ai dot x minus bi squared. What have I done? I've just multiplied and divided by the same term here. So here's going to be the trick. I'm going to call this thing, uh, in the notation of this slide here, I'm going to call this fi of x. Here, f stands for all the nonlinearities I don't know how to deal with. <laughs> Do you see that? So what is going to be my, my algorithm here? Well, essentially, if you kind of squint at this slide, what is this saying? It's saying that I sort of hold all of the, the fi's fixed, and I just optimize the g's. Right? So that leads to a very particular algorithm. This is called iteratively reweighted least squares. I do the following. I say for each of my i's, I'm going to compute a value, which is going to be exactly this thing. Um, OK. And now I'm going to hold them constant, and I'm going to optimize the rest of this stuff. But that's just least squares. right? So then I'm going to get that um, x is equal to a transpose times diagonal matrix of w times a uh, inverse time, oh, uh, time, uh, a transpose diagonal 
Do you guys see why? Like, so essentially all I've done, this is just the same as the sum w i a i dot x minus b i, right? So this is really least squares just with like a big w in front of it. So this is kind of like um, a x minus b transpose times the diagonal matrix of w values times a x minus b, like that. And so basically this is just the minimizer where I've held w fixed. Okay, so this is called the iteratively reweighted least squares algorithm, IRLS, and it ping-pongs between two steps, basically computes a bunch of nonlinearities, and then solves the least squares problem, thing back and forth, back and forth. Fun fact, this has been used for centuries to solve this problem. Also fun fact, proving conversions of this was an open problem until about 10 years ago. Um, and it turns out that under certain assumptions on A and B, you can show that this thing converted. Um, now, there's a, a bit of a problem, which is that oftentimes you would really like this norm to go to zero, but if it does, that this method will crash. Um, so the sort of common hack here is to do the following. <laughs> to say, uh, well, either I'll compute ai dot x minus bi, or some positive value, <laughs> and I'll just take one over whichever one's larger. So in other words, if I'm getting close to dividing by zero, just clip it at some constant. So um, the advantage of this algorithm is that it's extremely efficient to implement. Yeah? Um, one particular version, and yeah, so this is for L1 optimization. I encourage you to try it at home. Two lines of code, couldn't be easier. Um, and it now solves this extremely nonlinear problem. This, by the way, is probably easier to code up and derive than most of the L1 problems that uh, algorithms that people use in practice. But we'll also see that they're a little better. So this was the most classical one. It's been around forever. Um, these days, there's an alternative known as ADMM, which I would argue is the better technique. Um, I'm guessing in today's lecture we won't get to it, so probably on Thursday we will. Um, which is sort of the, I don't want to say state of the art, but like sort of the more reasonable template for these kinds of problems. Okay, so um, here's a, a particular problem that I think is kind of fun to study in the context of uh, iteratively reweighted least squares. And that's the following. So this is a very particular problem. Um, it comes up in geometry sometimes. This is a very concrete example. Uh, so let's say that I'm given a big data set of xi's. From i equals 1 to k. And these are all in Rn, like that. And I want to compute some notion of, of, of the average of the xi's, but I want to be robust. So in one dimension, like let's say n was equal to 1, what's the sort of robust version of average? The median, right? And there's actually an interesting optimization problem whose minimum is exactly the median of a set of numbers. Do you guys know this? It looks like this. So we're going to take a min over x, or n, the sum over i, so the distance x minus xi, the two norm, but not squared. <laughs> So in 1D, this is like the sum of the absolute value of x minus xi. I'm going to let you convince yourself uh, at home that this thing, if, if n is equal to 1, actually will give you the median of a set of numbers. It's kind of fun. Um, you can do it by kind of an argument about like overlapping intervals canceling out in, in, in the right fashion. But more generically, uh, this is, is known as the geometric median problem. So if I have a bunch of points like in the plane, now, I want to point those like kind of in the center, but occasionally I have some outlier that I don't want to drag my, my, my points away from. And this turns out to be the right model for that kind of a problem. So how can I solve this thing? Well, once again, sadly for us, this thing is not least squares, right? Because each of these terms is not squared. But we can do a trick, which is exactly the same trick that we just did before. Right? We can say, ah, well, this thing is nothing more the sum over i of 1 over x minus xi. This turns out to be kind of OK here, because the geometric median generically is not one of the points in your data set. Um, x minus xi squared. <laughs> you guys see the trick for turning things into least squares problem, which is just you divide by everything that doesn't make it a least squares problem, and then it's a least squares problem? OK, so let's call this number wi, just like before. Then notice, what is the the optimum of this least, this least squares problem. If I, if I think of this as 
sum of wi x minus xi squared, right? If I differentiate this thing with respect to x, what am I going to get? I'm going to get 0 is equal to the sum wi times 2x minus xi. Right? That's what happens if I take the derivative of this with respect to x. I'm doing this quickly, but hopefully by now these calculations are starting to feel kind of reasonable. So if I solve for x, what am I going to get? I'm going to get x is equal to the sum of wi xi divided by the sum of wi, which makes perfect sense. x is a weighted average of the, of, of, of the, the input data. <laughs> okay? So that leads to an extremely efficient algorithm for this particular objective function, which looks a little something like this. I have one is each of the wi's uh, gets to be 1 over x minus xi. And then step two is x becomes um, the weighted average, wi xi divided by some wi. See what we did? So let me get out of the way of the board. <laughs> so we took our original nonlinear problem. It's not linear because these norms are not squared. And we said, OK, we're going to square it and then divide by the difference. Right? This is our kind of goofy least squares approximation. Now we do have a least squares problem. We just forgot that the wi's are really functions of x. right? And so in this algorithm, we're going to hold these things constant, optimize for x, and then iterate. Notice that basically all these methods are just different fixed point kind of iterations. And in particular, OK, so our, our formula for wi, that's our first step. And then our second step, our update for x, in this case, actually has closed form. There is not a closed form formula for, for the solution to the original problem, but there is a closed form formula for the solution of this thing. right? And so in fact, the two steps of our algorithm are just two formulas. I code up this one, and then that one, and then this one, and that one. And this will converge to the uh, solution of the geometric median. Um, this, is no, uh, this algorithm has a name. This is called Weisfeld um, algorithm. Um, it is extremely efficient for solving this particular thing. Cool. In fact, um, now I was about to say something that was debated. Yes? This still will depend on the It absolutely will depend on the initialization. The good news here is that at the very least you can convince yourself, like here, notice that every one of the W's is positive, and that X here is a weighted average of the XI's. So every iterate of this algorithm is somewhere in the convex hole of the XI's. It can't diverge too crazily. <laughs> that, like, like, what, like one thing that can happen with Newton's method is it just diverges, right? This, the iterates just fly away and you, you never see them again. That cannot happen here because every single iterate here is a weighted average of my data. So it's like somewhere inside of the convex hole of my data set. So this is actually like a pretty reasonable technique. Cool? All right. So one thing that you guys might notice we, unlike the last couple lectures, we are not writing convergence proofs. And oftentimes there isn't one. Um, or like showing convergence for these methods becomes very difficult. So what people will do, I think we don't talk about it in the community much, but it's absolutely what we do, is code these things up and try it. And if they happen to work for our problem, that's great. And then maybe we spend another three weeks trying to prove convergence. And if we don't, then we just never speak of it again. But hopefully you guys are getting the name of the game, which is you look at your objective function, you find interesting structures that you try to leverage, and then you develop an algorithm around this thing. Okay. Now, specifically for this technique, there's, there's good properties and bad. I mean, I think the good news is that it's very easy to formulate. Um, the bad news is that it's hard to prove convergence. Uh, and indeed, it can degenerate a little bit. Like you are, there's like some division happening here. Okay. So continuing in our grab bag of objective functions with special structures. By the way, if you guys are totally bored with optimization, a few of you look like that might be the case. The good news is that we're almost done with it, and then we're going to start something totally new, which is approximating integrals and derivatives coming soon to a classroom near you. Um, another one that you guys have actually already seen is alternation. right? So what, what was an example from your homework of, of an algorithm that depended on, on like so, sort of taking all of your optimization variables, dividing them into two sets, Optimizing one set and then optimizing the other. Do you guys remember from homework two? Yeah, this is rigid as possible thing. Remember how that worked? I had one set of variables that were rotation matrices and another set of variables that were like positions in space. And if I hold the positions in space fixed, 
then the optimization major, uh, the, the rotation matrices were just SVDs, right? It was a closed form formula. And if I hold the rotation matrices fixed and optimize for the x, this is just least squares. Notice that if I tried to optimize for both of them at the same time, there, was, there wouldn't be a closed form formula for either one, right? So this is a, is, um, a very clear example of, of this strategy called alternation, where I take all of my optimization variables and I divide them into, like, in this case, two sets, like x and y. And I first optimize x with y fixed, and then I optimize y with x fixed, and I iterate. This algorithm, incidentally, does not have to converge. This is a little bit surprising. Um, and actually, this is one of the more common mistakes I see even in research papers in this domain. So what does converge? Now, the objective value of f certainly decreases in every step of this technique, right? So it's certainly the case that, like, if f is bounded below, then the, it, like, the f of x comma y, you know, it decreases and it's bounding below, so it does approach a number. Does this thing have to approach even a local minimum of f? The answer is actually no. This is a little surprising. We're going to draw a picture of y in a second. Yes, Axel? How is that possible? So let me draw you kind of an interesting. I'm going to try to draw a schematic, and I'm going to fail. Um, this is the story of my life. So let's say that I have a two-dimensional problem. Here's the thing I could do, by the way. I can totally construct this sort of adversarially, because I only kind of need to know my f on one slice at a time. So I could actually like kind of construct my f of x while I run my alternating algorithm. <laughs> We're going to see what that looks like in a second. So, ugh. by the way, there's a fantastic research paper out there that tries to sort of give interesting counterexamples where this technique fails because I think people just commonly assume that it converges. In fact, to my knowledge, there isn't a convergence proof for that as rigid as possible thing that you guys implemented. And again, when I say convergence, I mean convergence of the iterates, not of the objective value, right? The objective value decreases, but that does not mean that the iterates converge. Here's an example. So let's say my board is the xy plane. OK. And so here is uh, the initial point of my optimization. Right. So what does, um, what does alternation do? Like, essentially, it like draws a little line, so maybe I optimize over x first. It looks a little slice of my objective function. Notice nothing about the objective function anywhere else, right? And it finds the minimum. So let's say the minimum is here, because I said so. <laughs> okay? And now I optimize over y, and I get whatever I get. Now here's going to be the, the kind of magic trick, so I'm going to draw this little vertical line. And notice that like, this optimization algorithm does not know the first thing about what happens in my objective function, even a tiny step away from this one-dimensional line, right? So here's the kind of thing that can happen. So maybe my objective function is sloping downward in this direction, but actually upward this way or the other way around, right? Oh, I got that backwards. It's sloping downward this way, and up here it's sloping downward that way, <laughs> right? So now when I solve for x, I go back like here. That makes sense? I mean, that could easily be the case. You guys could construct function where it's like decreasing this way and decreasing that way, and like maybe it's flat somewhere in between. Easy enough to do. Now maybe I optimize y, and there's a similar situation here. And I end up like that. Okay? So far, we're, we're, so, far so good. Like, it feels like we're going to spiral in and get some point in the center. Right? Wrong. This is where things can go wrong. So in particular, when I optimize an x, I optimize some y, optimize some x, I optimize some y, right? So I'm, I feel like I'm spiraling inward. But maybe if I look at this distance here, every time I do this, it, de it decreases by a factor of one half. So in particular now, let's see if I can draw this. This distance gets even smaller, so it gets like kind of closer to the wall, the last guy. You see that? Uh, now it gets even closer to the wall, the last guy. and so on. <laughs> Notice that like, I can construct this objective function because I only ever needed to know it on these 1D slices. I could easily fill in some smooth thing in between. Easily a little wrong, but like, like an adversary could figure this out. Right? And what's going to happen, eventually there's some little inscribed square here. <laughs> An alternation is going to happily ping pong around this square. <laughs> and the iterates are never going to converge. And in fact, you can even 
so there's a really interesting paper. Um, the authors, if you like this kind of thing, um, they're Italian, so I won't even attempt to pronounce their names. Um, they actually construct counterexamples where you have this sort of like spiral staircase thing. These iterates get even closer, but the minimizer is still there. <laughs> Um, it's really wild that these kinds of things can happen. Um, so in any event, um, these are the kinds of things that, that, that are, are really messy and you have to worry about uh, in these kinds of methods for alternation. On the other hand, I think oftentimes in the engineering discipline, we kind of don't care. <laughs> that like this, this situation is really uh, adversarial and bad. It doesn't happen in real life. And uh, like I've never encountered an objective function where alternation didn't converge, but it is a thing to be aware of. Okay. So anyway, this is a fun counterexample where like, a totally re in fact, I would say this algorithm feels more reasonable than the iteratively reweighted least squares methods that we wrote down. But actually, there are cases where this one doesn't converge. It's, it's much harder to find cases where the other one doesn't. Yes, Paul. Well, what is a local minimum? I mean, like every time you do this, you're moving a positive amount. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very hard to define exactly what you're looking for, right? Um, yeah. These are really tricky counterexamples. Yeah. And again, I think these are like mathematician counterexamples. I, I, don't, I don't think, which obviously is my code word for useless. No, I, uh, but like, I, I think it, 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 it's sort of very hard to encounter these things in, in real life. But, but they, can, they can occur. So if you really want to prove that your algorithm works, you have to, you have to defend against this kind of picture. Yeah. Um, that said, if you look in practical literature, it is everywhere. I would say alternation is one of the most common structures you encounter in practical everyday optimization. Because it's very easy to make problems. Typically, like they're like maybe least squares with one variable fixed, and then some other simple thing with the other fixed. Um, as rigid as possible is one example. Like we already saw that before, right? Where the notice that the rotation matrices are like in the least squares problems with the unknown positions. So if I optimize for them simultaneously, I have some yucky nonlinear thing. But if I fix half the variables, the other half are just least squares. Right? That was the point. Um, another good example of this is principal component analysis. Ah, you all poke up. Yes, machine learning. Um, so, so in particular, um, I think I can erase this picture before you guys find more holes in it. Um, a very, you know, if we think of uh, uh, the theorem whose name I just forgot. Oh gosh. When I do SVD and I truncate the low singular values. Yes, the Agar Young theorem. Thank you, Chris. Um, Essentially, you can think of principal component analysis and, and these SBD truncation methods as all solving the same problem, where I have some matrix M, and I want to approximate it with some matrix XY transpose, which is of lower rank, right? So um, in particular here, you know, maybe M here is like M by N, so like it's columns or data points, and I want to write all the data points as a linear combination of some small number of factors, right? That's the sort of common situation. So maybe my factors are in X, so this is like, M by rank, and then Y, so to be clear, because there's a transpose there, is in, um, I guess, N by rank, right? This is one of many ways to understand principal component analysis problem, right? And what we showed, if you remember from lecture long, long ago, was that if I put the Frobenius norm here, then essentially I can solve this problem by computing the SVD of M and truncating low eigenvalues. You guys remember that? This is the eckert young theory. We even proved it, I think. So that's all good uh, as long as I use a Frobenius norm, or in fact the two norm, it turned out that the, the same is true for both. But there's actually a whole giant literature out there that proposes different versions of, of, of SVD. For example, maybe I want robust SVD. And in robust SVD, what, maybe what I say is that like, every once in a while a column of M is just garbage. Right? So in other words, like, I expect this fit to be perfect for most columns of M, like I really do think they're in a low dimensional subspace. But then every once in a while I give you like an outlier that's just, li it lives in its own thing. So then this least squares problem isn't very good, and maybe we want to use something like L1, right? Well sadly for us, <laughs> now we can't use SVD anymore, right? Or, uh, yes? Actually, it depends on precisely the, 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 the problem you're studying, whether you trust columns of M or elements of M. I'll let you think about that one. Um, but like, essentially, you can cook up all kinds of weird norms here. 
And there's actually, I, I meant to, to, if you remind me of your class, I can send you a link to the research paper that has this giant table where they just like summarize. This is a great way to manufacture research publications and statistics and machine learning is to just like put another norm here and then say like, ah, well, I have the robust, weighted, you know, PCA dimensionality efficient, whatever, PCA. So now I need to put this weird norm I just clicked up. Um, each one of these things, or like maybe I, I want to like force X and Y to be similar is another uh, uh, version of this. Each of these corresponds to a different choice of norm, and a very typical thing here is to just fix X and optimize for Y, and then fix Y and optimize for X, and ping pong back and forth, right? By the way, notice if I used uh, Frobenius norm, this actually creates what I would say is kind of an intriguing method for uh, doing SVD-like calculations, right? Because we know from Eckerd Young theorem that the minimum of this over X and Y is going to be that, like, basically the column space of X is like the span of the first couple columns of U. And so, actually, a reasonable heuristic algorithm for for computing the first couple columns of the SVD is to solve exactly this: like alternate between X and Y, and just do a bunch of least squares problems. Um, and I think you can show actually that that particular alternation does does converge. And again, this is a good example where like the Frobenius norm squared. This is a quadratic function of the elements, right? So it feels like a least squares problem, but these are themselves quadratic in the unknowns. So There's a product between x and y. This is actually a quartic problem, so we don't know how to solve it unless we use one of these techniques. Paul looks suspicious. No, he's, he's good. He's just a suspicious man. Okay, fantastic. If we take our alternation strategy to an extreme, we arrive at one particular method, which is called coordinate descent, which is exactly what it sounds like, where I solve for precisely one element of my vector at a time. This is actually a very common thing to do. In fact, oftentimes it leads to very efficient algorithms that are parallelizable um, for all kinds of different uh, 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 reasons. So as uh, one uh, simple example here, um, let me give you yet another algorithm for solving least squares. <laughs> it's our favorite problem. Um, by the way, notice it's not just like a model problem, but it actually is a problem we, we want to solve in everyday life. Um, so let's say that I want to minimize um, the norm of AX minus B. And now I'm going to write this as the sum over elements of B, right? So we're going to say that this is like AI dot product with X minus BI squared, right? Make sense? Hopefully I did that right. Uh, this is actually a little different than how I wrote it before. Yeah, that's okay. Um, we're going to just do it from, from by hand and see if we get it wrong. Okay, so, uh, and in particular, what is AI dot product of X? So this is sum over I, this is the sum over J, right, of the matrix of uh, A, row I, column J, XJ minus BI, quantity squared. Make sense? So in coordinate descent, I'm going to optimize for exactly one X at a time. Yeah? So uh, let's say that I optimize with respect to xk. <laughs> okay? Then, then what am I going to get? I'll get 0 is equal to d over dxk of ax minus b squared. And what is this thing going to be? Well, it's going to be the sum over i of 2 times the sum over j, aij, xj minus bi times the derivative of this thing with respect to xk, which is going to be a i k. That make sense? Did I do that right? Wait a second. Ah, sorry, give me like two seconds. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, do, 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 do. yeah, okay, so, I'm sorry, this disagrees with my notes, but we're going to end up in the same place, but I'm like thinking, I'm thinking like a human, which is why it's taking me in that, uh, rather than just copying out of a page of notes. So let's move uh, the, the sum uh, to the inside here. So in particular, this is going to be 2 times the sum over ij. 
a i j x j minus the sum over just i b i a i k like that. Okay. So if I want to solve for x k, remember that's what we did before. That's that was the whole reason for doing this. I get a formula, right? I get that x k is going to be equal to well, what? Well, in some sense, I'm going to have like an aik xk somewhere inside of this sum, which I have to pull out to the other side of my expression, right? So eventually, I'm going to get an a <laughs> like that. I'm going to have this guy remains the same. So this is going to be sum over i b i a i k minus the sum over i. That was supposed to be an i sum over j except k a i j x j. Okay, that's the formula I wanted. You guys see why this is the case? So what was I doing? I have this least squares problem here, and I'm just minimizing with respect to a single element of x. Notice, this is just like our conjugate gradient lecture. Like, this thing is just a parabola. <laughs> it's a complicated parabola, but it's just a parabola. So I differentiated with respect to uh, xk, and I got this expression here. But I need to solve it for xk, which is hiding somewhere inside of this sum. <laughs> right? So I have to isolate that one term in the sum. That's what's going to give me this coefficient, right? because it's going to be aik. And now I've got bi aik there, and then the remainder of the sum there. OK? Yes? That's a great question. So this thing, what does it do? It took my objective function, and it found its global minimum with respect to 1x. And now, of course, usually when we solve ax equals b, <laughs> there's a lot of x's. Yeah? This, uh, th there are a lot of strategies for how to choose the order here. Um, notice that one cycle through the x's is not enough, because like the second I optimize x2, x1 is no longer globally optimal anymore. Right? And so. Um, a very typical thing is to just cycle through the indices or to do them in random order. These kinds of problems can work OK, uh, especially when like, it's a least squares problem. So like, A is kind of a dis disorganized matrix anyway. <laughs> right? So in that case, like, you know, there's no difference between different rows. So maybe it's just kind of randomly draw a few of them. Here's a really bizarre trick that people in parallel computing do, which makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but actually can work OK. Uh, and it turns out it's like, I would, I would put it in the category of mildly principled, um, which is the following. So, so like this algorithm absolutely converges. I can just keep cycling through the xi's and typing in this formula here, and eventually I'll get the solution to ax equals b. Right? And the good news, by the way, is it only needs like kind of like one or two rows of my matrix at a time. Here's a really bizarre thing people in parallel computing do, which I hate. It makes me very uncomfortable. I could evaluate this formula for multiple k, like one per processor, very quickly, right? Like I could, and and and, you know, this is just a closed form thing. There's no Gaussian elimination, nothing. It's just a formula. This is like a, like our, you know, Axel could tell you how to do this in like negative two seconds. Both like literally and figuratively, you know, he, he could write the code and and in his brain knows the code. Um, a very typical thing people will do here is they will just remove locks on their parallel threads. <laughs> So I'll have like 10 different threads, each of which randomly will draw a k and, type, and start evaluating this formula and replacing that element of xk. Right? And so like maybe one thread is working on x25, and another thread is working on x72. Now, in order for this formula to be true, I need to lock everything else, compute xk, and replace it before going on to the next iteration. A very common thing in parallel computing is to say, I'm just not going to do that. I'm just going to assume that this thing generally takes xk and replaces it with a better one. And so I'm just going to like happily you know, apply this formula over and over again on multiple things all at once. And I'm just rewriting the memory and not caring if I happen to have a conflicting read. And it turns out that this strategy often succeeds. <laughs> um, in fact, analyzing that algorithm, as you can imagine, is very difficult. It requires not only linear algebra, but also statistics. Right? You have to show like, what is the likelihood that two threads touch the same x at the same time. The answer is it's very low. <laughs> Yeah. And actually, the case here that matters, it turns out like if you apply this update on like two x's, but like the right-hand side was correctly evaluated, that's like sort of OK, because they both got a little better. The case where this gets really problematic 
is I get halfway through writing the bits of xk, and then somebody else is evaluating this sum over here, and so it has half the bits of one number and half the bits of another number, aka garbage. Right? And so what you have to show, show if you were like a good algorithms analysis parallel computing kind of person is that the likelihood of that clash is like very, very small relative to the number of updates you can do. Right? So like that clash will occasionally replace XK with garbage, but with much higher likelihood for every like one of these, a hundred other ones are getting better. And so on average, the whole thing is improving. <laughs> it's just incredible to me that these algorithms can work, but they're really cool and they're easy to code. Yeah. Like I'm in the middle of writing this XK, and another thread is reading the same XK to do its update. So like literally like the first 16 bits of XK are like the old value and the second bits are the new one. Or like maybe I just I'm doing the read and like this is cached somewhere and like there's some, some piece of information that's just floating across. I think the more typical situation is you would get all the bits of XK, but half the terms in the sum are from an old X and half the terms are from a new one or something like that. And it depends on your model of computing, but the, it, it, yeah. This is one of these ones people have analyzed to death. Um, if you like reading about this stuff, there's a really cool machine learning po paper that was popular years ago, um, which is called Hogwild, which proposed exactly this kind of class of algorithms for just doing millions of parallel updates and removing all the locks in your parallel code and just praying to God that you don't accidentally overwrite your data too much. Which is fantastic from a parallel computing perspective because what gets in the way of parallel computing are all these pesky locks. So like if you just ignore them, then like well, you know, coding is much better. It's the only problem is that like you've broken the laws of physics or something. Yes. What was that? Ah, Paul asked a good question. There's a different variant of this algorithm, which is the following. Evaluates, holds all of the right-hand side fixed, and evaluates this update over all k in one time without updating any of the x's, and then replaces all the x's in one shot. This is different than what this thing is saying, which is update one x at a time, right? Um, no, that algorithm does not obviously converge. Yeah. <laughs> it's really easy to get these things wrong. I encourage you to just play with this. This is one of these things where you could either, like, spend months proving a theorem or just type two lines of code in your computer and very quickly get an, kind of an empirical idea of when it works. Yeah. Yes? Is it not just a worse version of conjugate gradients? The answer is yes and no. I mean, like, in terms of, like, memory access and matrix vector products, like, this is certainly optimized for, like, a certain pattern of, like, traversing your matrix. And so it could be... You're right from like an iteration perspective, it's worse. Like if you just count the number of k's. Yeah, this is just conjugate gradients where your search direction is EI, right? It, but there are, are certain cases where this kind of coordinate consent can be very efficient. Um, I think, by the way, the more common version of this is uh, an algorithm called SMO for uh, sequential something optimization, which is uh, for optimizing um, support vector machines instead of least squares, but it's basically the same trick. Uh, cool. So with that, I think we'll we'll call for the day. We're gonna in our next lecture, we're going to conclude optimization. You know, we've like slowly been building up this giant orifice of very complicated optimization algorithms and scores. Um, we're gonna conclude with one special case of um, alternating techniques, which kind of harkens back. Remember, we kind of motivated Lagrange multipliers as like through this duality problem, and one way that we can uh, understand one class of constraint optimization methods is that they're doing alternation, but between x and the lambdas. And in particular, that's going to lead us to a technique called the aug augmented Lagrangian method, and eventually to a method called ADMM, which is, I think, the sort of standard way that people solve a huge class of convex problems. So that is going to be our last optimization algorithm, I promise. And then, in the second half of next lecture, we're going to talk about numerically integrating and differentiating and, and, and inter interpolating values of functions, which I would consider to be about 3,000 times easier than the last five lectures of this course. It's like back to underground level stuff. Okay, so with that, everybody have a lovely Tuesday, and um, that's all I have to say. Okay, let me stop the recording here. <laughs>